Kwatame, <laughs> let's talk about books. Um, she encourages connections by talking about books, both those books that reflect the reader's lived experiences and those books that expose readers to new perspectives, which ties in perfectly with the iRead and CSLP summer reading programs this year, which are Find Your Voice and All Together Now. Um, we're excited to have Meg here tonight as part of our summer reading program. Um, Meg, if you want to go ahead and turn your camera on. Here I am. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody Great. out there. All right. Um, just a couple things before we get going. We um, do not have the chat on, but the Q&A is on, and we will have a question and answer section at the end if you want to ask Meg any questions. Um. And thank you so much again for joining us. And I think that you are going to start out by doing a little reading. Oh, yes, right off the bat. Okay. Right off the bat. Well, if you wanna talk, <laughs> if you wanna introduce yourself first and talk a little bit about that first, if you'd rather do that. Sure, oh, no, no, I'll just, I'll jump right in. I'll jump okay. right in on this beautiful summer day. I hope everybody's doing well. So, you know, when I'm asked to do readings, I never know really which which book to pick, which, you know, whether picture book or an older book or whatever. And so I decided that I was going to read from um, Merci Suarez Can't Dance. You might have it in this original cover, but it's just been rejacketed in these beautiful pink covers. And they're both those covers are by Joseph Beda, one of my favorite children's illustrators, the same guy who did like... Um, the cover of Esperanza Rising and anyway, one of my favorites. So the reason I'm picking this one is uh, this is the second book in the Merci Suarez series. The last book just came out, Merci Suarez Plays It Cool. But Merci Suarez uh, Can't Dance is the, the middle book that came out during COVID. Ah, right. So we all know what happened to those poor books that came out during COVID. Um, but it's Medici in the seventh grade. And I'm gonna start reading from on page 123. I'll just read for a couple of minutes so that you could get the, the sound of it. And what's ha I, I chose this because it's a moment in the seventh grade when um, Medici is, uh, is getting ready, you know, the school dance is happening, the heart ball, which is just this, the bane of her existence, the thought of going to this school dance. And her friend Hannah is working on the dance committee. Hannah, who loves nothing more than glitter and arts and crafts. And um, Edna Santos, her arch nemesis, Medici's arch nemesis, uh, is being rather friendly to, to um, Hannah. And so this is just a moment among three girls in the seventh grade. And I, I think this is going to sound familiar to a lot of you. Medici arrives holding a box that she, uh, of used CD she's going to donate um, for the dance committee and hear this. Hello? I step inside. Light is coming from the last space that's around the corner behind the screen, so I walk over. It's Hannah. She's standing at a work table with Edna, and they're each armed with a shaker full of glitter, and they're aiming it at an enormous cardboard heart, which I suppose is for the heart ball. But they're laughing together so hard that they don't hear me when I come in. Hi, I say again. Hannah turns. Oh, hi, Mercy, she says, trying to catch her breath. Her cheeks are flushed, and little dots of glitter are stuck to her arms. Edna stays mum. I step closer. What's so funny? Nothing, Hannah says, but she turns pink in the face and snorts a little. Kissing, Edna says. Hannah tosses some glitter at Edna, gross, and then they burst into giggles again. How is kissing funny? I think back to the two options that Edna explained to us in gory detail in the locker room not too long ago. It almost made me sick. Her sister had told her everything she said as we huddled near the unused showers to hear. There's wet and dry, depending, and tongues could be involved. This year, Edna likes a kid named Brent from the eighth grade who has muscles and the start of a mustache like a high schooler. It's kind of scary to look at him. 
Maybe now she knows about kissing for real? Who's kissing? The box in my hand feels heavy all of a sudden. As I keep my eyes on Hannah, I'm thinking about Thea and Simon all over again. Not me, Hannah says, and relief washes over me. Of course not, I say. Edna shrugs. Well, you have to kiss somebody sometime, she says. We all do. We're nearly 13. I stare at her thinking, is that a rule? Hannah keeps her eyes down on the heart that she's decorating, considering the bare spots. Her cheeks are blotchy. What's in the box? She asks me suddenly, and I pull it out. I hold it out as she peeks inside and pulls out a CD. Oh, we could make mobiles. They'll sparkle on the dance floor. She looks at me. You want to stay after school today and work on that with me? But Edna pipes up before I can answer. Don't you think we have enough decorations, Hannah? She says, besides, those CDs are going to look small and cheap hanging from the gym ceiling. She glances at me. No offense. The warning bell rings and Edna grabs her backpack. She puckers her lips at Hannah and makes big smoochy noises as she heads out the door. Bye, Hannah, Hannah, Bobana, she croons and Ed Hannah laughs. Then she looks at the clock and gasps. Ah, we only have a few minutes to get to homeroom. Can you help me put this away, Medici? I don't want to be late. I glance after Edna, wondering why she didn't stay to help and why Hannah doesn't seem to mind. Hannah hurries to place my box of CDs on the shelf while I move in what feels like slow motion, putting the glue bottles back where they belong. She grabs the uh, broom and dustpan and begin sweeping. And all the while, I'm thinking back to last year when Edna tore up the costume that Abuela helped make for Michael Clark. How Edna invited everyone to a sleepover party except me. Why does Hannah like her? And why is she on this stupid committee? Are you and Edna friends now? It sounds like I'm accusing her. Are you going to start kissing people? I want to ask. And Hannah puts down the broom and moves the hearts to the drying rack. She turns to me. We're on the dance committee, that's all. She's bossy and horrible, I point out. Hannah says, sometimes yes, but not always. And besides, we declared a truce, remember? You have to try too. I dig in. Almost no one likes her anymore, I say. Not even Rachel. Hannah plucks at her hair nervously. Merci, that's mean but it's true. Before Hannah can argue, Lena's voice comes over the loudspeakers to start the morning announcements. Hannah turns off the lights and we hurry down the hall. Good morning, Rams. This is Lena Cahill and Darius Elmer. It's National Tater Tot Day. She asks everyone to stand for the pledge and Hannah and I freeze in our spots like we're supposed to. I can't see a flag anywhere though. So we have to pretend. We put our hands to our hearts and we promise our allegiance to thin air. And I'll stop for that. The moment in seventh grade. <laughs> the moment in seventh grade. The seventh grade is is rough I, mm. for everyone. And I I think that's why I love the Mercy books is they are so good at capturing those moments of middle school when you are just trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. 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 And there's so many corners to figure out, right? Uh, there, there's there's figuring out your friends, figuring out love, figuring out your body, figuring out your teachers, all of it. It's just such a stew. It's been fun writing those books for that reason. And, and sometimes, you know, awkward, sometimes it's awkward to write them, you know, like I oh. feel awkward writing the <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. Um, but Seconding an embarrassment. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, do you think you'll continue with Mercy as she gets older and maybe goes into high school or wouldn't keep that going be fun. after this? No, nope. No. I want to write the arc of the three years, sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, mostly because I don't know what you were like in middle school, but like, if you look at a picture of me when I was 10 and 11, getting ready to go into middle school, and then fast forward to me, 
like entering ninth grade, it, the, the, it's shocking, right? It's, the, the metamorphosis that happened. Yes. And that gave me plenty to unpack. And I, yeah. I also wanted to unpack a family's journey through illness um, mm -hmm. and see that to its, its natural stopping point. So there are other kinds of books that I want to write. There are other stories that I'm, you know, teasing apart in my mind right now, but I feel like the mercy books are complete. If, if there would be anything at all, it would be those little twin cousins of hers, Domas and Axel, like they are impossible. Like they deserve a chapter book series. I think they just, the, the... I, I think that sounds like a fantastic idea. <laughs> Yeah, they would be who, wonderful. Who would survive out. them? Yes, <laughs> and we've oh anybody who's teach who teaches out there has had a Thomas and Axel duo. They have had to tangle with them before. <laughs> so speaking of teaching, you have a long career in education before you started writing, um, and you've taught in New York, in you Florida, and Virginia. So you've had lots of different experiences. Um, can you talk a little bit about the commonalities that you see in the day-to-day -day experiences of kids in different parts of the country? Because like sure. you said, middle school, we all go through those awkward years. So um, what are some of the things that were similar? Yeah. No you taught? Well, I taught in New York and in Florida. By the time I came to Virginia, I was, I was, I had become a mother and I was sort of segueing into writing. So I did yeah. other kinds of things here. But anyway, I did teach in New York and Florida. So, um, you know, I think some of the differences are, especially when you teach in a place like New York City, right? And I grew up in New York City. You grow up fast in New York. You see a lot. Um, you're face to face with, you know, the ups and downs of humanity, right? And so you don't have the luxury honestly, of being an innocent for very long. Um, and so I feel like when I work with kids in New York City, I, they, they know a lot about people in the world and so on. When I went to Florida, what was interesting is just suddenly living in this outdoor place, a place where people ate their meals outside and, you know, people had pools and well, you know, there were alligators to worry about and st things like that. So I, I think place sort of determines the things that you know about. So what, for example, my kids were all born in Florida when we lived there. And um, when I was writing the Mercy series, you know, I was very much thinking about like Lake Worth, Florida and the West Palm Beach area and, and the kinds of school trips that kids in Florida take, like to see, the, you know, the turtles. And, and it's very different than a trip that you might would take like in mm -hmm. New York City with those things. But um, I think kids are kids in terms of how they have to stretch themselves and how, how they have to figure out how to cope with each other and with their families. And, and honestly with themselves, right? How they have to face themselves. That piece um, was the same. And the other thing is that when I'm writing books, I'm not often writing, I, although my readers are going to be kids in different places. The person, the kid that I'm accessing when I'm writing is, is me <laughs> yeah. many years ago, right? Um, and that's of course the miracle of it. That, that there are some experiences of growing up and having your eyes open and, and um, coming of age that are in fact timeless. The question is, can you write those things that are true in a way that feels relevant and fresh for the audience that's reading it now? That's really the trick of it. But yeah. to get to the truth of it, you have to go, I think it's a very personal journey. Oh, I love that. Thank you. So in 2019, you won the Newberry for your first Mercy book. Mm -hmm. um, and you gave an absolutely beautiful acceptance speech. Okay. Um, I'm going to read just a couple lines of it. Um, Life is full of wonderful surprises, like new friends in the sixth grade and lousy ones, like loneliness and family illnesses. She discovers, as always children will, that happiness and heartbreak coexist in a life well lived. 
sometimes all there is to do is switch to a different gear, push on, always with the hope of a better day. So you gave that speech and then a couple months later, uh, the world sort of shut down (laughs) Um, and the pandemic started and we had all of the shutdowns for COVID. Um, So thinking back on that speech now um, and then thinking about what has happened, how do you connect the two and the experiences that the kids, because pre-COVID kids, or it's very different the they the missed school experiences oh my goodness yes well i couldn't have possibly have even imagined nobody really could have what what <laughs> it, what was about to happen to us i mean i remember i was scheduled to go to shanghai china to do some book work in in schools in shanghai um And we shut down in March. And I remember the conversation on email with the teachers. Well, maybe in May, you can come. (laughs) Right? (laughs) In May, we were, I mean, it was just in in retrospect, you know, how little we knew of what was going to happen. And so um, I think what, what the speech was about and what my work is about and maybe what we have to really dig into right now is the issue of how can we be really resilient in the face of of change, some of which we don't want and can't control. And and that is so much, I mean, has always been the situation with with growing up, right? So many things change on you, so many demands are made, so you have so little control when you're a kid, right? Or it feels that way to Mm -hmm. you. Um, but now we were all in this in this same sort of boat. I don't know. I think when I when I visit schools now, I do see um, kids who have missed out on big chunks of things. You know, kids who are, who graduated high school just this June may not have had an a, a eighth grade graduation. They didn't have proms. They didn't. Uh, you know, they attended school on this, on on this monitor and so on. And I think it did come at a cost um, to their reading lives, to their emotional lives, to their family, and in some way to their outlook. But I will say, since we're talking about speeches, is that when I became the national ambassador, I had to give a speech um, that day for my inauguration. And the first thing I said is that we need to help children walk back to joy. And I believe that. I believe that. Um, We need to help them find lightness and hope and um, fun activities. We need to help our teachers find that, our librarians find that. As As a whole system that loves and supports children, we need to find our way back to joy. You know, in my life, I feel like reading and books does, can do some of that heavy lifting for us, but it's, it's a many pronged, a many pronged problem, but the heaviness of, of the last few years, the, um, the bitterness, the um, anxiety and the prickliness that we have for each other. um, I'd like to walk us back from that from that chasm. Yeah. Um, So (laughs) touching on that prickliness, you have been very outspoken about the book bans. Um, You were part of an anthology by Leonard Marcus on censorship and book banning, which was wonderful, a wonderful read, by the way. Um, And I know that one of your YA books was under some controversy and Um, it feels like, uh, we are finally getting to a place where books are starting to be more diverse, um, after years of having none. And with that is coming these book bannings and critical race theory and trying to erase, um, a lot of lived experiences, especially with people of color. Um, and I know you're very passionate about this. Would you like to speak a little on? Well, sure. 
and I, and on this, I'm going to be very clear that I'm I'm speaking as Meg, right, and yes. not as the ambassador, because it, it, when <laughs> when I'm talking as the ambassador of, of literature, I have to be very aware that I'm the ambassador for all children in this country, and that includes children whose parents see things very differently than than I do. Sorry. Yes. Um, but as Meg Medina, I'm going to say this. <laughs> Um, I think by the the largest the the group taking the biggest hit right now is our LGBTQ um, youth. Um, those experiences are being um, flagged and targeted um, with a ferocity. Um, and but it's spreading also to cultural content that's being cast sort of as being un-American, like to to state um, a point of view or to we tell an experience that makes um, someone else uncomfortable is sometimes called being anti-American or not good for this nation and, and so on. I think that's a risk. That's a really severe risk for sure to, to kids from our communities, right? Um, who need very much to see their lives accurately described and respectfully put on the page. It's also a huge loss to kids who are not from those communities to have a really reliable window in and a way to understand folks who may be their neighbors or classmates, or maybe they're not. Maybe they're living in communities where they don't feel like they have many Latinos or whatever, and, but they're being, um, denied a chance to sort of learn about the world vicariously. In general, what I think is this, and what I say to, to families is this, the most powerful position that you could be in with your kid is one that is, uh, involves communication, right? Mm -hmm. So my suggestion is that we read more books together, we read together, that we talk about them, what you agree with in the book, what you disagree with in the book, allowing for your opinions and your child's opinion, right? And allow for that to be what knits a sense of respect and, and um, wholeness. I just don't think that creating obstacles to reading or to deny people access to books is, is a powerful play. To me, it reads like a fearful play. Um, and, and a damaging play. So that's, that's how I stand. And I know for, for those of you who are watching, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but many of you will be at ALA, I'm guessing soon. And um, I know that there are numerous wonderful panels, including one by We Need Diverse Books that I saw advertised that I think would be probably be worth um, sitting in on for just practical tips on how we can um, have these conversations, coexist in communities, uh, and advocate for our kids. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that it's very important. Um, and now putting your youth ambassador hat back on. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I like that one of the things you said is having the parents talk with their, read the books together and talk about it, which that ties right mm -hmm. back into your Quitame, let's talk. Yes, up. I'm going to teach you how to say it. Listen, yes, please teach me. me. What is it? Quintame. 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 So, okay. like, cuentos are stories, and mm -hmm. me is me. Quintame, story me. Oh, I love it. Think about it that way. Yeah, quintame. Mm -hmm. Quintame. Quintame. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And I could talk about books all day, especially kids' books. So I, I, I think that is the best tagline for an ambassadorship. I love it. Um, can you tell us how you came up with that and what you hope to do with that? Yes. So Cuéntame, my daughter Sandra is, uh, you know, like a lot of Latino families, right? Like at the longer we're here, like language becomes this thing. So the Spanish that Sandra knows is the Spanish that somebody born here learns. And so it's a little like when they do translations, it's a little clunky. So when I got selected as ambassador, they asked you to design a platform and to name it. 
And so the platform is like, what do you want yourself to stand for? Like when people think of your ambassadorship, what do you want them to know? And so I'm the first Latina ambassador. So that had to get sewn into the identity of it, but I'm everybody's ambassador. So that had to be sewn into it. And it had to be an invitation. So Spanish speaking people, when we don't see each other for a while, like if I didn't see you for a while, Ruby, I'd say, oh yeah, Ruby, cuéntame, how are you, right? So it's a welcoming, warm, it's like an embrace. Like, so tell me what's happening with you. So cuéntame, let's talk books, includes that invitation and that signal um, that it, it includes Latino books, it includes language books in other languages, and it also is let's talk books in English because I am, you know, an American citizen and 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 the uh, national youth ambassador. So story me, story me, bathe me in story because I think that's how kids are. So it has three big components. The first one is book talking, which is has nothing to do with book reports, vocabulary lists, tests on the story, diaries, none of that. It's a one and a half minute book talk. Like, tell me why you love this book and why you think I should read it. And the reason I love to help kids know how to do that with enthusiasm and with joy is that when you talk about a, a book that you really love, you're not really just talking about that book you're actually talking about yourself. Yes. You're talking about what it is inside of you that makes you tick and what excites you. So I, they book talk to me, the books they think I should be reading. And I book talk to them um, at different stops along the way, uh, new titles, like new authors that I, I am excited about that I think they should know. The second thing is connecting families with public libraries. Um, and connecting school libraries and public libraries, like creating relationship there. The library as like a vital place where a family can go and create the habit of literacy and the habit of using this free space, like for all kinds of purposes, whether you have a language cafe where you can practice learning a new language with somebody in Minneapolis you could go and sew something you know they have sewing machines in their maker space you can print something you can learn you know there's so, you know what libraries are they're fantastic places yes, so just reconnecting families with that as opposed to this very old notion of the shushing place and then the last part of Guentame is um still being developed, it'll probably be part of my second year as ambassador, which is I want to develop a an archive at the N Library of Congress, housed within the Library of Congress's collection of children's book authors who were creating work during my tenure. And I'm going to ask them to read me just as I did a minute and a half of their work. I want them to tell me one thing they think is true about reading and one thing they think is true about growing up. I think that elevating children's literature and children's writers into the archives of the Library of Congress is important and it sends a huge message. And I feel like in a minute, like that a kid can press and, and listen and it's free, they can get a sense for that author and hear what they sound like and have a little window into that author's heart that could take them down, you know, you know, another path with that author. So that's Cuéntame in three, three quick steps. And I ha I have some um, books here that I can book talk for you. Would you like to hear? I would love to hear them. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So, so picture, if you will, that I have been selected. I'm at a school and I'm visiting and I go, um, and I have this chance. Now I write these down because I don't wanna forget. Okay, the books that I am going to book talk to you today, the first one is a debut. Ooh, this one, Confessions of a Candy Snatcher. This oh, is wow. by Foebe Sinclair. I know that looks like it says Phoebe, but it is pronounced for this person, Foebe in, uh, Sinclair. And it is illustrated by Theodore Taylor III. It is a Candlewick book that's coming out in August. So the bound books are, are out now. It 
falls into that sweet spot of 10 to 14 year olds, you know, like that upper elementary school mm -hmm. and then that younger middle school. It's a tricky age, but this is where this book sits. And it's 315 pages and it's sort of illustrated. Here it is, Confessions of a Candy Snatcher. What is the worst thing that you have ever done in your life? Hmm. And does anybody besides you know about it? Ooh, that's a sticky question. But that's what 12-year-old Jonas is up against. For a couple of years now, he and his friends have been Halloween night candy snatchers. Boys who prey on little kids on Halloween night. They stalk, they chase, and they steal their candy. Nobody gets hurt, right? It's kind of fun and exciting, right? And his friends, even hothead Mikey, who rules the roost, says it's no big deal. Except when a note gets dropped in Jonas's locker that says, I know what you did. Who knows about what happened that night when Jonas attacked a kid he knows and a kid who fought back. And what's gonna happen to him if his classmates find out what he's been doing, if the school finds out, and worst of all, if his parents who are already living, in a, living apart and at each other's throats, if they find out he's dead. This is a novel that is so full of voice that I can't help but be impressed that Foybe is a debut author. It's incredible. Um, I don't know how a first-time novelist can nail the sound of a 12-year-old kid so well with so much humor and so much honesty and sometimes with heartbreaking love. Also, without the use of quotation marks, might I add, so this can be a challenge to read, to get used to, especially if you're one of those prickly people about punctuation. This is written the way kids now write with their thumbs, sometimes without punctuation at all. It touches on making zines, those little handmade magazines. It touches on male friendships. It touches on pressures. It touches on violence, on the things that we like to shrug off and say are not serious. It touches on families and how they break apart, but mostly, mostly, mostly. Confessions of a Candy Snatcher examines how we find our way back from the worst side of ourselves. I really recommend it. That's why. That sounds amazing. It is. It is really amazing. I love this book. And full disclosure, I am published by Candlewood Press, but I would love this book even if it was published by Macmillan or anywhere else. Okay, I have another absolute treasure. Maybe some of you know this book already, Gibberish by Young Volk. Okay. If you are a code breaker, you're gonna love this picture book. That has sailed many miles across the world on a boat and a plane to get to his new home. But today is his first day of school. When people speak, it will sound like gibberish done. Just listen and do the best you can, Ma tells him. And so begins his day. With the bus driver and the teacher and all the students, it does sound like gibberish. In fact, they all sound a little monsterish, perhaps a little like aliens which is where the illustrations come in. All of the characters at the beginning are drawn like aliens with no way to communicate or read or understand what's happening. School becomes a very lonely place until something special falls out of a tree. Something, or is it someone who begins to change everything for the better? Being somewhere new and not speaking the language can be really scary and lonely. But this is a story of what happens when people around us reach out in friendship to help us break that code. I love this book. I, and I loved it. Like I was thinking of my own book, Mango Abuela and Me, and I would love to see these two books paired somehow. 
I love how the artist shows how we break the code of language and how we can come to see people not as strange aliens, but as new friends. And if you are very clever, and I suspect that some of you are, you will take a look at these end papers and discover that the artist has left a secret language message in code for you to figure out and discover yourself. Gibberish by Youngbo. Well, that looks amazing too. And I now I, I want to go to the library and check it That's out right. so I can get, I need to break the code and see what the secret message is. So oh. you can picture when I go to these schools, like I talk about that and then they ask me questions and then I say, so what are you reading? Cuéntame. And then they tell me what I should be reading. And it's it becomes very fun. It becomes a very loose, wonderful book conversation. That's awesome. I love that. So do you have, um, I'm going to throw this out there. If we, the questions are open, if anybody has any questions, please submit them to the Q and A as of right now, it doesn't look like we have anything. Um, but I do have one more question for you, Meg. What is your advice to kids out there that are, um, thinking that they want to be a writer and they're trying to find their voice and they want to tell their story. Do you have any advice or tips or any inspirational sayings for them to think about? Yes. I have no inspirational sayings except the <laughs> one on my door. Wait, wait, if I tilt my computer, you see, it says, do what you love. What you love. Yeah. That, that is stuck on my door for years, mostly now because I can't get it off without ripping off the paint. But I do believe that. Um, okay, so advice for writers. Here's what I say. The first thing is you, you're going to have to be a reader, right? Just read widely, as widely as you can. Read the things that you really love to read. Experiment with the things that you've never read before. Just read and read and read. It gives you words. It gives you uh, tools and ideas for how to write, um, you know, how to do a mystery, how to do a cliffhanger at the end of a chapter, like all of that comes from reading a lot of examples like that. I would also say to you that when you're a student, when you're a young person, your voice is developing and your voice is changing, sometimes literally, but it is true like in your writing voice too. And that's cool right? It's not always going to be perfect. So one thing that I used to do when I taught writing to my students is that we would use mentor texts, right? We'd look at, um, let's say, a book written by Julia Alvarez, or maybe Tori Maldonado, or Kate Camillo, whatever. We'd pick a book um, that we thought was really good about one particular thing. And we'd do our own assignment, sort of experimenting with that strategy that the author used or with the voice that that author was using. You don't want to copy someone else's voice, but it's perfectly reasonable to tap around, figuring out different ways to say it and how you're most comfortable sounding on the page. Funny story is that when I first started writing, I had very few examples of Latino literature, right? I just I had grown up reading all of the, you know, what we, you and I were talking about before we started recording, right? Like the the famous canon of, of American high school literature, help us. Yeah. Um, and so when I started writing, I had this sound almost like a British person on paper. What did that have to do with a Cuban girl from Queens? Nada. But in my mind, I felt or I had been led to believe or been educated on this canon like this was the sound of good quote unquote good writing so it took reading outside of that it took reading house on mango street it, it took reading out finding all kinds of voices to help me find my own so don't be in a quick in a big rush necessarily to find the final voice but um Give yourself lots of room to grow, I think, is the best is the best advice I can give. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and we'll give a few more minutes for questions to come in. So while we're waiting, 
Um, you just mentioned House on Mango Street. What are some other books that you loved growing up? Well, House on Mango Street, I didn't read until I was in college, but growing up, my very favorite book was Charlotte's Web because it was yes. a book about friendship. And I think I still, you know, and about relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Sacrifices, relationships, hard choices. And so it's kind of interesting, right? Like fast forward all these years in my own work, I'm examining some of the same things. I don't do it with Templeton the Rat and, and uh, Wilbur and Charlotte. I do it with other characters, but those same enduring questions about friendship and what do we do for friendship and how do we show love and what, how do we sacrifice for, for one another and when should we sacrifice for one another? those kinds of things. But that was the first book that made me cry. And I, I still, I remember it so well. That was my favorite. But I did all the, all the sort of typical things that, that um, young people were reading then. I read all the Nancy Drews. I read Judy Bloom, of course, who's having her big moment again recently. Yes. I hope you've been enjoying that this oh, summer yes. as much as I have. Um, in fact, tomorrow night, I have a grown daughter who is 32 years old. She and I are going to go see Are You There, God? It's Me, uh -huh. Margaret, uh, the film. So I have been putting that off, but I'm very excited to go tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, read, I read a lot. Um, I didn't have a lot of things that were culturally specific to me. So I cannot say that it stopped me from reading. But boy, when I did find books that sounded like my tias and tios and, and had people that looked a little bit more like my family and so on, it was such a, it was such an opening that happened inside of me. It was like a permission that, that got granted. So, yeah. All right. It looks like we do have a question. Um, do you have a ritual for getting started in writing? Do you need a certain food or music or a special writing location? Yeah. Oh, I like that. I, I wouldn't say it's a ritual, but it's, I guess um, this is what my day looks like. I get up. I always, um, I'm an early riser. So I'm usually up if I, I don't know, 730 or so, 7, 730. I, have my coffee. I read the paper old school on paper, not on screen. <laughs> um, I just, there's something about just sitting there and taking it all in. Um, and I can take news better written than I can on television. <laughs> Let me just say that too. <laughs> so anyway, I read the paper um, and then I stretch out because I know that I'm going to be sitting for a long time and that could hurt me. So I um, stretch myself out and then I come here. This is my family room. Well, no, this is my office. It used to be the family room. And then slowly I stole this room from right from <laughs> under my family's nose. I started with box by box, but right now it's just, you'll see, I have lots of, that's my messy desk. I have a sofa in here and I have that door is to the bathroom. Um, that's my supply closet. So. Um, I have a nice comfy sofa where I can sit and read pages. Like when I write, I sometimes will print them at, in 25 page chunks to just see if I like it, if I, what I've written, I've liked. Um, yeah. And that's, that's what I do. Food, unfortunately, it's coffee that I have, which is just, <laughs> I can, I can jack myself up too much um, on that. I think and that's a requirement for any writer. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Um, what am I reading this summer? I see, I see that question. So yeah. I was reading Hello Beautiful by Ann Napolitano. And you know what happened? I took it with me to the Gaithersburg Book Festival and I left it in the bed like I was reading in bed. And I, I got up and that book is still there. So then I came home to the library. I just didn't want to spend another $25 on a, a book. So I, I put myself on the, um, on the list to you know to when it comes available and I'm currently like 91st on the list so I don't know if I'll ever finish it but I was two-thirds of the way through and I was enjoying it very much I am reading my beach read right now is a book that I just started called the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo I think <gasps> yes um so good is it good it's am so I gonna good. enjoy it oh okay yes. all right so I just that started is a perfect that summer read and I am reading a lot of 
uh, kids books. So I am reading a lot of middle grade and picture book, just writing, reading. And as soon as I finish, I, I write the, um, the book talk, like so all the saints in the household is a YA that I just read, um, by Ari Tyson. I also a debut novelist. So yeah, I'm always reading something always. Yeah. All right. Oh, I like this question. Do you have your Newberry, your Newberry medal in your office? I have my Newberry medal along with my ambassador medal in the room next door. It's in the, I have like a glass cabinet where fancy things, uh, fancy breakable things are in there. <laughs> and I have my awards are on the bottom in there. I keep them sort of safe, but I also have downstairs in my, my house. This is sort of the first floor of the house. And then you can go downstairs. My husband works from home and he has a, uh, an office down there. And so he had one big bare wall and he created a big brag wall for me, right? And that oh. has all the things. It has like newspaper articles that are framed and, um, you know, citations from the Senate that I, you know, all the things <laughs> that happened when I when I got the new bearing. And so uh, every once in a while when I, you know, when I'm doing the laundry or something very glamorous like that, <laughs> I, um, I'll put my laundry basket on my hip and just regard <laughs> the other part of my life like I have I have these two things but you know yeah. that, that exist within me <laughs> I love it I love that your husband made a brag wall for you that's he did. he's a that's good wonderful. egg <laughs> all right um I don't think we have any more questions um we've only got a few minutes left do you want to leave us with any final thoughts or um sure I, well I would just say you know I'm a huge fan of summer reading I don't think there is a time of the year that I love reading more than in the summer I do I mean I read every single day in bed and all of that but there's something about summer about hammocks about porches about the pool and the beach and all the things that we could do that it is just magical to me so um I all of you who are, I know there are a lot of librarians out there who have designed incredible summer reading programs for their communities. And, you know, thank you for doing that. Um, and if I could be of any service to you in that way, you know where to find me, um, you know, come on my website, send me an email, but um, good luck with it because I, I have such fond memories of summer reading just in my own life and still have. Um, still think of summer as like my prime reading time. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for being here with us today. It was wonderful to talk to you um, and learning about your ambassadorship and all of the things you love in the book talks. Um, so it was great having you. Um, thank you. And I'll see and some of you guys in Chicago, I think for ALA, those of you who are traveling that way. Please yes. make sure you come and see me. I'll be signing with Candlewick. Um, so check out the, the schedule um, and uh, it'll be lovely to, to see you. And do you have any books coming out soon? Well, I have. Um, yes, I do. What am I thinking? Um, the gra <laughs> so here, I'm going to show you. This was, um, this is the graphic novel adaptation <gasps> of Oh. Yaki Delgado. So Yaki Delgado, this is the anniversary issue, which just came out. I love it because it has this really like bright yellow interior, Ooh. but um, it's 10 years old, this book, and still really relevant. And it has been adapted into a graphic novel by uh, Mel Valentine Vargas, who you can meet at ALA also. They did a beautiful job um, in the adaptation. and. Uh, I, I'm eager to hear what you guys think. Yes, I, I, I must say, I love this trend of turning middle grade and YA novels into graphic novels for their anniversaries. Yeah. I agree. It's a whole new, um, it's a, a new way to, um, yes, long live Yaki. Uh, <laughs> it is a whole way, a new way of delivering story. Yes. And engaging uh, kids who prefer, um, who may prefer it in that format. And I still think it opens the same sorts of conversations and has the same depth. So Absolutely. I'm excited to see how it does. All right. Well, enjoy your time in Chicago. Will do. And it was great talking to you. Thank you so much for being with us today, Meg.
Thank you, Ruby. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me. Take care.